right, ready? Yeah. Welcome to Secondhand Sellers, where we discuss thrifting, reselling, and all things secondhand. I'm Sarah. And I'm Clayson. And Thanks today, for us. yes, thank you. Today, we're going to be talking about the advantages of parting out items that you find reselling or lotting them up just to get them out of your inventory. Yep, and we're also going to introduce uh, segments this week. This is a new thing we're going to try where we talk about um, a segment called Overlooked Items. So this may be a recurrent theme. We may bring this segment up again in the future, but we're going to try it out and see how it goes. Yeah. So to start off, do you have any advantages um, when it comes to parting out individual items versus lotting up a whole lot of things that you got? To just dump. So as far as parting up, so far, I haven't done much of that. Um, the only things that we've really separated were things that maybe we bought in a in a bundle. Like, for instance, we got a bunch of video games in a bag, mm -hmm. and we did separate the, those things out in different ways. Um, we are more prone to lotting, lotting things up. So... For instance, we like to lot up when it's a low-value item, maybe selling together um, would make it more worth actually making a listing mm -hmm. because I try to I have thresholds. I don't want to sell like $2 items and things. It's just not worth the effort. So by putting things together, sometimes I like to do that. Um, and then things are like sets and things like that are, mm -hmm. are obvious ones for me. But do you part up? Um, it depends on what it is. For example, like... Let's go back to um, man, my brain right video now. Games. <laughs> uh, no, video uh, yeah, yeah, video, video games. games. Um, so, if you buy a bunch of video games and you go through them and you can find, well, this one's worth forty bucks, mm -hmm. and then the rest of them are worth eh, ten dollars or fifteen dollars or under. Like you said, it's not worth your time investing into listing each of those individually. And sure, you could get your bottom dollar by listing each of them for 15 bucks, but they're going to sit on the market for longer mm -hmm. versus if you bundle up all those smaller ones and even sometimes with the $40 item, mm -hmm. you might get a faster return for your profit, which in the long run will be better. But personally, I'll take the $40 one out and just bundle up the rest of them, give whoever is buying it a better discount. Yeah, so the, the low value yeah. sort of concept. I think sometimes um, when it comes to stuff like that, you can also use, when you part out the more expensive one, but you mm -hmm. have a bunch of less desirable ones, or maybe you have one or two that are more desirable and some that are not desirable at all, I think that's also a good way to sort of move things that you may not have otherwise purchased. Mm -hmm. So if it came in a big collection, you got it all for five bucks at a yard sale and they were just like, take it all. Don't leave anything. Just take it. Yeah. Um, it's a good way to get, get it off your shelves and, and out. Th that's what I wanted to bring up. The the stamps that you bought, uh, you were talking about last time where you oh, had the letterpress. The letterpress yeah. Mm -hmm. Where specific ones were beer branded. You wouldn't want to go ahead and just park them up with the bulk ones, but you got it all at such a great rate where, it's worth your time going through finding out the high value ones, selling those individually, mm -hmm. and the rest of it just bundle up, call it a day. Yeah, and we actually ended up, I lucked out on those because mm -hmm. I ended up, um, a girl I knew from my days at college, uh, my recent days at college, she got into letterpress. She was in art, she was my graphic designer when I worked on a magazine, and she got into printing. And she actually owns a letterpress machine. She bought one that's small, and I contacted her because I knew she was into printing based on something she'd posted on Facebook. And then I asked her if she knew anybody because I thought she might in the community. Well, it turns out she did. She paid like $150 to take a bunch of them off her hands. Um, she bought all of our like individual letters that we were selling, and that was that was a real advantage because those individual letters just are not going to go for a lot on eBay. Mm -hmm. They're heavy when you're talking about all metal print blocks. To ship those would have been... A nightmare. A problem, yeah. yeah. And so individual print blocks are not a problem because they don't weigh that much, a few ounces or whatever, even a few together. But if you are selling 100 print blocks and they're all made of metal, mm -hmm. it weighs so much and the, the shipping would be cost prohibitive. So in that regard, 
reaching out using, I actually use my network in that case, to find the right buyer and then sell them in mass for cheap. She got a good deal. Mm-hmm. We did not, per item, it was less than, it was less than bucket item. I mean, it was, you know, not much per item for her. We had already made our money back by selling other blocks and typeset drawers, uh, typeset drawer and things on eBay. So she got a deal. We got rid of a large amount of our stock, which may have taken us forever yeah. to get rid of. It, and there's something to be said about having that slow burn of 10 to $20 items. Ten, I, I really like to sell items like 15 to 20 bucks. That's my, yeah, that's the, the sweet my, spot. My sweet but... spot. There's something to that where you sit down, you have a bunch of those listed, but when your inventory is just backlogged with all these items that you end up ever eventually either promoting for a higher percentage mm-hmm. or dropping down for a greater value for the customer just so that way you can get rid of it, and even then sometimes it doesn't sell, mm-hmm. it's better to just offload a large quantity like that, especially when it's somebody that you know personally who's mm-hmm. going to have a great use for it. So Yeah, and I didn't, because it was an interpersonal reaction mm-hmm. or interaction, I didn't have the extra fees and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff, the, the nightmare of trying to package it and ship it. Um, it just walked out the door, yep. which was really great. And some of those that we sold to her, I had actually listed in smaller lots on eBay with no luck. Some of the letters and stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I like it for that kind of thing. And we have some of the print blocks left over that are less desirable that we probably will be doing the same thing with. Listing them as a lot, selling them cheap just to get yep. them gone because at this point we've made our money. When, when it comes to sitting on an item... It, Sitting on an item that's been on your eBay store for a period of time, at what point do you go, okay, this this has been in my inventory for too long? So I've only been, we talked about this last time, Mm -hmm. I've only been a reseller for a few months now. Um, Like officially a reseller, intentionally a reseller for a few months. And so we haven't gotten to the point that things have sat for years or anything like that, obviously. I don't like it to sit around too long, though, so I will discount and to try to move. Um, some things, I decide it's been long enough if I'm not getting a lot of interest or no views. Mm-hmm. But I have other things that I think would be good to put it to, with it. So this happened recently. We had, at one point, my sister and I had purchased a giant lot of, I mean, it was like a stack of antique postcards. They had been, most of them had been posted they were from like turn of the century, like 1907, 1908. There was a few cool ones. I pulled out a few cool ones. We we basically, this was before we were reselling. So we bought them. We split them in half. And then Hannah and I just had been sitting on them. And so we each kept, went through our stacks again. We kept ones that we wanted and then found a bunch that we didn't want. And some of those were like, these are not going to be worth it. If you look up antique postcards, it varies a lot in condition. Subject matter, lots of things that go into it. There are resellers on eBay that sell antique postcards. So we ended up just taking those and lotting a bunch of them together and we sold them for like 25 bucks. I think to a person who sells antique postcards on eBay. Who's probably going to go through, take the time to list them individually. But it got you your money back, Mm -hmm. gets it out of your inventory. And it's, you can move on to the next thing, something that you actually know or have an expertise in your knowledge. So that way you yep. don't have to waste your time going, am I really getting my top dollar for this one postcard? Yeah, and I don't want to list 50 postcards for $5 a piece or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so after we had sold that lot, there were still some hanging around that we didn't manage to like tuck into the lot. Yeah. And so they weren't ones that, for a couple of reasons, that we didn't want to sell individually and I had kept out a few for, they were Niagara Falls postcards. Mm-hmm. I had them listed still on our eBay. It was three Niagara Falls postcards. I had them listed for 10 bucks. Not really moving, not getting any offers, just kind of sitting there. So I made the decision recently, pull those off, add all these, like the few that we had around that we wanted to get rid of with them, relist them. They're gone now. Nice. Yep. Yeah. So I would rather that than... Just sit on the Niagara postcards yep. for, for nothing, you know. So I use it. I often use lotting to get rid of things. Yeah, because I I tend to find 
if you try to squeeze every last dollar out of whatever you got, mm-hmm. you're going to take longer to squeeze those dollars out mm-hmm. versus, all right, let, let's squeeze those dollars out and move on with our life. <laughs> yeah, and especially something like that. Like I said, some of the other ones that were sitting around, I put, I put with the Niagara Falls mm-hmm. ones, we wanted them gone. And yeah. so we the I don't even know how much we paid for it because it was years ago. So that was just something that we would rather just have the money now and out of our face, you know? Yep. Cool. So, so um, have you ever actually parted anything up that wasn't like like a, a something like a collection or sold something for parts? Um, so I've sold things for parts. Um, in fact, recently I found a laptop in the dumpster mm-hmm. and I knew nothing about it. Didn't know if it worked. It didn't have the battery, didn't have the cord for the charger and... Something like that, normally, I wouldn't care. I would just leave it in the trash. But, honestly, people will buy things to fix up and resell themselves, refurbishing. And I said, why not? Took it home, wiped it up, listed it, and it sold within, like, two days. Mm -hmm. And I think it sold for 25 bucks plus shipping. It's just easy cash. It took me maybe 20 minutes to take care of it. Mm -hmm. I would much rather do something as quick and simple like that every day where I have no emotional attachment to it. Uh (laughs) No prior knowledge. I just went off of the um, recommended selling price. And it sold. It got out of my life. Mm -hmm. But for hurting out... um, Recently, at a garage sale, I found a whole bunch of paper hole punches. You mean like decorative ones? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. They, what's the, it's uh, Martha Stewart. Mm-hmm. Those paper hole punches, which if you're ever out there in the wild looking at arts and craft material, you need to get the Martha Stewart ones because those ones can go for 10 to 15 all the way up to $40 each. Seriously? Yeah. Depending on which ones you got. For a decorative hole punch. Mm-hmm. Yep. They weren't even that much to begin with, probably. No, no, probably not, but it's Martha Stewart, so whatever. But I got a whole bin of them for $15. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's like $0.67 cents a piece mm-hmm. that I have into them. And I've gone through some of them. I went ahead and listed about half of the ones that I know are worth selling individually. The rest of them, I'm just going to bundle up into little lots and go, eh, $10 plus shipping, $10 Mm -hmm. plus shipping, just because it gets the customer a good deal. I only have, you know, $15 into the whole thing. When it's all said and done, I'm hoping, you know, a decent amount of profit will come back. (laughs) Yeah. And I haven't sold any yet, which is kind of annoying, but... Excuse me. Um, when when you've got that much stuff, that much quantity, because I think it was, what, six, it's somewhere in like the twenties. Mm-hmm. You know, when you have that many hole punches, it's a great deal. You can't pass it up. And and there were some things I only knew about the Martha Stewart hole punches beforehand because I actually bought one and sold it before. Mm-hmm. It was the pumpkin. One, it looks like a jack o' lantern. And when you're out there at garage sales or at the bins or Goodwill, when you see th- something that is niche, it looks weird. Generally, that's going to sell. Mm-hmm. And decorative paper hole puncher is <laughs> apparently something that somebody out there is collecting. And desires. So. Well, I think particularly that one, that example, of, like mm-hmm. the Jack Lantern, a lot of people craft around the holidays mm-hmm. for decor. They send out cards. They decorate their house. So yeah. I think that seasonality plays into it, too. You know, and they're already thinking about what they're going to be doing this fall or next winter or whatever. And they're yeah. you know, collecting and, and, their supplies. And there are other ones. It's just a bland little decorative shape. But somebody's willing to pay 10 bucks for it, plus however much for shipping. 
By all means, let them go ahead and buy it for ten bucks <laughs> plus <Obviously>. shipping. <laughs> um, I think too that kind of brings up a something for me, and maybe you mm-hmm. work this way, maybe you don't. But you were talking about how much you have into it, and that particular like the whole bunch of yeah. fifteen dollars into it or whatever. I find, and I found this with the print blocks as well, because the print blocks were a pretty big investment. They came in two types of drawers and. There was a lot of them. Mm-hmm. So Hannah and I both spent a decent amount on those um, without 100% being sure like we thought we could get our money back. Um, it, we've over doubled our money now. But I found that once we hit that point that we had paid for it mm-hmm. or almost paid for it, it was so much easier to just... Yeah, to, to let go oh, of your profit Yes, you margin. can. Oh, I love that offer. Take I'll mm-hmm. take it. We had that happen today like... We just want them to move at this yep. point. And so once you've gotten to the profit margin where that it's paid for, it, to me, it just opens up the gates as long as you're making something. That, that brings to mind, um, whenever you get an offer from somebody on eBay, mm-hmm. do you have like a particular percentage target that you really like to hit? Not always. It depends heavily on what the item is, mm-hmm. how long it's been listed, um, that thing where they're not, I have still money into it. Yeah. You know, because for instance, the print blocks, any money we make off those, pure profit. Yep. So that's different than when we were still trying to recoup or some of the other items that maybe I have a buck or two bucks or three bucks into it. And so I'm more concerned about how much I'm going to be making based on that, especially with eBay fees. Yeah. Um, so I don't really have a certain percentage, but I do take into account sort of those factors. Do you have a percentage? Um, the most, if anybody sends me an offer, um, as long as it's a 15% or under discount, if they send me an offer, I'll take it. Mm-hmm. Because generally, whatever I'm getting to resell, that 15% margin isn't going to screw me over on how much money I'm putting into my pocket, even after fees. Mm-hmm. Um, and... If they send me an offer and it's, you know, $2 cheaper, what's $2 to me, you know? Mm -hmm. If it means the difference between getting the item sold versus, okay, instead of $15, I made $13, -hmm. i will gladly sell it for $13 just to get rid of it, turn my money around. So when it gets to that 20% margin... Like you said, depending on what it is, how much money I've got, how long it's been listed, I'll consider some of that. Some items, some items I'll, I'll pick up for a dollar or two dollars. And so them offering a difference of a 20% discount versus, you know, a 15. Okay, I only have a dollar into it. I'll, I'll give you the 20% yeah. discount. <laughs> I think that's especially true if you find something very cheap, mm-hmm. cheap and you can sell it for a lot more. Mm-hmm. I've had a few things where the margin between what I paid it for it and what the actual market value was was very high. Yeah. And so it didn't matter as much. You know, I, yeah. oh, I can go 20 down, down 20 because whatever. Like, I I have paid this much, you know. Yeah. Um, but, so yeah, th- those are all factors that I do too and that, I don't know. I, I'm not super attached to stuff some stuff i obviously will hold on more yeah. like we're, we've, we're selling some nes games and they were my husband's it's sort of outside of our business we're using our ebay platform but it's more for just getting rid of the personal things and, and making that money so those ones we don't negotiate as much and i let my husband kind of dictate whether or not he wants to accept offers or send offers right. or anything like that but i think it's especially true things that came out of my house that I've had for years. So for instance, the postcards, they just need to go, yep. you know? And so if someone's going to, and more often than not, because I'm cheap, which you will hear a lot from me, um, even the things I'm selling from my personal life, the likelihood is, is that I paid very little for it originally, especially if it's like a vintage item or something. I probably picked it up in a state sale or somewhere around it for cheap. So I don't know. Cool. So do you have any other before we move forward, any other th- comments on parting or lotting or anything like that? Um, I say overall, just do your research. 
that's the biggest aspect when it comes to making that decision because it can be the difference of an extra 20 40 80 dollars yeah but how much is your time worth as well mm-hmm. if you're if you have the time where you're doing it as just you know i've got a saturday afternoon free and you're dumping a couple of hours into it but you're going to make an extra 80 dollars it just took you 4 or 5 hours to do all right cool it's extra pocket money mm-hmm. If your time is more valuable than that, you're not doing it as a hobby, you're trying to make that into a full-time income, just lot it up, give the customer a better discount, get it sold. Yep. All right. Shall we move into our segment? Yes. All right. So like I said before, we're going to talk about overlooked items. So what this is, um, the segment is all about things that we pick up, (laughs) that we may look for, or that we've just run into in our travels around the thrift universe <laughs> um the tri- thrift first yes, the thrift first <laughs> that catches on i'm trademarking it okay anyway so um that, that can be the first t-shirt there you go thri- oh that is a great thrift one first. thrift first <laughs> watch for that to come um that actually would make a really good t-shirt it would <laughs> <laughs> okay anyway things that we think other people tend to leave behind mm-hmm. they overlook um, we've talked about I'm an estate sale person. A lot of times I go with the last day. So a lot of the stuff I buy are things that are, have they, they've sat there the entire sale. So do you have any? What are your top overlooked items? So I have two in particular mind. The first one, I pick these up for a dollar to 50 cents all the time. And I sell probably about one or two a week hats. Like baseball caps? Yeah, I pick up baseball caps for super cheap. Dollar, 50 cents. They're Generally, I'll get ones that are branded with, like, logos or mm-hmm. they're, you know, Bass Pro Shop or something. They don't sell for a ton. They sell for, like, 10, 15 bucks plus shipping. So you're not making a ton of money, but you're turning $1 into 10 consistently. 10 times, yeah. yeah and, you know, factor in there. You might get a discount where somebody goes, how about $7? Okay. You only have a dollar into it. Sell it for seven plus shipping. But you go to a garage garage sale where... I've been to a few garage sales where there will be a ton of them. Like a sewing collector? Yeah. Like like an old guy. He had a whole bunch of them. I'll pay 20 bucks and I'll walk away with 25 hats. It's something that I can take you got to clean them. Mm-hmm. So there's that factor. You got to factor some time into it, a little bit of OxyClean. But in general, it's a $1 into $10 on such a consistent basis. And they're easy to store that they're generally overlooked at garage sales because they're not that big ticket item that most people are looking for. Mm-hmm. That's one I could think of. Well, and I think they're so specific to the individual, too. Mm -hmm. Not everybody wants a Bass Pro hat. It's not something I would buy. Right, exactly. So you have to have the right person at that garage sale to buy it. Mm -hmm. Whereas, And I think this is true of a lot of things. Um, When you're in person, you're at a state sale, you're at a garage sale, sometimes a thrift store. The only way they're going to sell that, unless a reseller comes in, is if the right person walks in. Yep. And some stuff... There's not that many right person, like right people out there that in this area. Mm-hmm. But by you taking it from this area, you list it online, there's your there's your buyer. The one thing you're talking about that the right person. I love going to garage sales where there is sports, like a specific baseball team or mm-hmm. football team, and it will be like, Why is the Kansas City, you know here. Like yeah, here in Michigan where nobody around su- supports that team, aside from, obviously, whoever was living there. But I'll pay a dollar for the shirt because nobody in the area will buy it. But it can go up on eBay and sell for 15 plus shipping or 20 plus in shipping Kansas City. to somebody in Kansas City who will want the shirt, you know? Yep. And it, it made a sale for the person who was running the sale. Yep. But also you can get it to the person that... That would actually want to buy that item. Yep. And generally at a better price than what it would be brand new. Yep. Especially sometimes you find stuff at sales, especially from people who 
maybe buy a little too much, um, untouched mm-hmm. or once warm or I mean just pristine sometimes. New tags. Yep. All the time. So did you have any other things that you think are top overlooked items or do you want me to go ahead, go ahead jump okay. in there. My big one, I have a couple of things, but my, my top, top one is wine glasses. And I've talked to you about this mm-hmm. and I don't mean just any generic wine glass. There's a billion generic wine glasses out there. They're cheap. They're not worth it, but specific branded wine glasses. And in particular, I look for Riedel. I think it's Riedel. It's, it's a German brand. I think they're made in Austria. Um, R I E D E L E L. And I told you about this. So this particular brand makes two different kinds. They have two different lines. They have a sommelier line that's hand blown. So they're extremely expensive, brand new. And then they have a more, um, they're still nice glasses, but they are machine made. More your general use glasses. Right. You'll see those a lot more because they're more affordable. They're still, they're not a cheap glass, but they're affordable more so. So I look for these at estate sales in particular, but you can find them at thrift shops. I have one downstairs that I, it was, I, it was a really pretty glass and it's, it's a Somali line. I bought it before I was reselling, um, that I have done in my China cabinet that I bought, I found it at a Goodwill for a dollar. Okay. So I, the ones I told you about, they were Somali line. I paid $5 a piece for two of them. And then I found, went back to the sale later on a discount day and I found two more that I had missed, uh, for three seventy five dollars a piece. So I had a decent amount for, reselling margins you might think five bucks for a wine glass whoa um but i sold them for like 50 or 55 on ebay because these glasses retail for like 129 Mm -hmm. brand new and people collect them they're beautiful glassware like once you start paying attention you can see the difference between low quality glass and like crystal and things um and so i always look for the sommelier line because of that a lot of people undervalue them at estate sales even if they know what they have they don't think people are going to pay top price for that i think and like i said sometimes you find them at the odd thrift store yep but what i learned recently and i, I did another experiment is i tried buying the machine made ones still popular popular glasses the margins aren't the same but i bought a set of three for four dollars at an at an estate sale again um just generic machine made retail glasses and I sold all three already. And so I sold two as a set and then I sold one individually like a week later. And this was fast profit. Yep. Pretty fast. And so always look like that. I think some, sometimes kitchenware in general Mm -hmm. is overlooked, but in particular, I think wine glasses are, but you have to know what you're looking for. How, how do you ship those? (laughs) Yards of bubble wrap. Yeah. (laughs) Lots of bubble wrap. Typically I, um, the one, two, the second set of glasses that I found at that first estate sale, the, the Somali line, happened to have been in a Riedel box. Oh, nice. So I used, reused that. I bubble wrapped mm-hmm. the crap out of them, put them in that box, and then put that box in another box, and then shipped it off. Yeah. But generally speaking, tons of bubble wrap. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that's a biggie. Don't be afraid to ship fragile items, especially when you can take it. Five dollars and turn it into fifty. Yeah, and I have I had no complaints. So we had four orders out of the wine glasses that I've sold. I think it's been four total orders, and not one said that it was broken. That's awesome. And I shipped them to Florida. I think one might have gone to California. I, I don't know. I shipped them all over. Cool. Yep. So let us know if you do like this segment. We'll try to implement it into our future episodes talk about some of the niche right niche would be the word for that probably niche things that you should be looking for when you're out there sourcing your items particularly because other people aren't looking for them Mm -hmm. so you can sometimes get a really good deal yeah all right so we have one more thing today we have a, a topic called favorite items to sell yes so what are some of your favorite My items? My favorite items. Start? All right, I'm starting. Um, <laughs> the stemware. I think the stemware is fun. I think particularly, not. I mean, the margins on those first ones were 
so good Mm -hmm. and like really cool. But I think because even though like people, you paranoid about breaking and oh, it's fragile. They're so light Mm -hmm. that the shipping costs, even though you're wrapping it in a ton, like a ton of packaging and stuff, it's not really that big of a deal. They're not that hard to pack if you've got boxes. And I think that's a fun thing to sell. Um, but also, I like the letterpress print blocks. They were small. They are small, typically. And if you aren't selling them in a huge lot, they're lightweight, relatively speaking. We wrapped them in bubble wrap and threw them in a bag, and it was, you know, off they went. And it was Poly fun. bags are amazing. Yep, that's what we ended up putting it in. Yep. With a little, little in ta- bubble wrap taped around it or whatever. So, those are fun for me. Do you have anything in particular? Um... I've actually had a decent amount of fun selling um, just toys in general. Like just, just general toys. Just older toys in particular because you can get a lot of older toys such as Barbie or G.I. Joe. I, I paid $4 for this bag full of Barbie toys. Mm-hmm. I think I've made like $150, $160 off of just everything in the Barbie bag. I'm guessing the movie helped. <laughs> it, it did. I did bag. I did wait like two weeks before listing any of that because I waited till the movie came out. <laughs> nice strategy. So um I knew it was coming out and it was just like oh, I'll pay four dollars for this bag of Barbie stuff. And it turned out it was these um did I talk about this last time? Maybe? No? I don't yeah. know. But these uh kitchen littles which was like an offshoot of Barbie. It wasn't even Barbie, like Mattel brand. It was some other company that made it to go with girls' Barbie sets. Wait, so it's, is it a Barbie accessory? Yeah, like an accessory that was like an off-brand. What era? It, from the 90s. Okay. And late 80s. But even still, they were very popular and sold for a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Really? <laughs> and... That was another thing I took the time. I parted it out into sets that I thought made sense. Um, yeah, I made really good money off of that. So are you selling, when you say toys, you're mostly selling vintage or nostalgia related toys, right? Yeah, the, Not the, actually the, toys for kids to play with. The vintage, well, I have picked up some toys where kids today are going to want them, but in general, it's that nostalgia factor. The ones where I I don't know much about it. I just look at it and go, "Wow, this GI Joe's from 1985. That's cool. A dollar? Sure, I'll pay a dollar for it." And then I take it home and I do the research. And doing the research, you learn a lot. Mm-hmm. You, you learn that oh, this company did it from this time to this time, and then they lost their contract. And that that's all cool stuff to learn. But when you only paid a buck for it, and then you can lot it up with a couple of other ones you find at Goodwill or whatever, and turn it into 20. So is that, is it, what makes it, like, your favorite thing to sell? Is it that they're easy to find, and you can often get them cheap? Is it the nostalgia part? I think it's the fact that you're giving it a new home. It, it was sitting in someone's basement, in someone's garage, just on the shelf anywhere at a Goodwill for who knows how long. And someone else is going to have that nostalgia factor because they grew up with that toy. Mm-hmm. And you're giving it a new home. It, and I do enjoy being the nerd and learning the research of, about that because it makes it easier to find one in the future. But in general, you're just making that connection with whoever is buying it and they're pleased. So Cool. Um, did you have anything else that you that are, that's like pops on your list? No, um, not that I can think of. Although you know, we all love finding the the brand new items with the tags. You know, those are nice. <laughs> I also it like makes it easy to sell. I, well, yeah, because you don't even have to like look for imperfections and mm-hmm. stuff. It's just already labeled, still uh, sealed. I would. I do still look for imperfections because one thing, I picked up um, a bunch of, what is that, Vans, T-shirts. Mm. They're all brand new. But half of the ones I got have stains on them. 
How does that work? They were stored improperly at the store they were at. Oh, like a leak in the ceiling or something? Yeah, it looked like they were all folded and put into a closet or whatever, and something leaked on them all. And that's how they ended up at the garage sale. I got them for like 50 cents a piece. Mm -hmm. But it sucks because they're all brand new. I'm going to have to take all the tags and the stickers off, throw them into OxyClean, try to get that out. And it's brand new, but I'm not going to be able to list it as brand new. Just because, That's true. Because I'm changing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would probably if I were in that, that does suck. And I, I think there's probably a difference between new with tags and mm-hmm. in box or yeah. unopened. Mm-hmm. Because something's coming packaging. And even if the packaging's damaged, inside's going to be fine. Yeah. But I might even say, even take pictures, I took the tags off myself so i know they're unworn yeah but not with tags or or whatever just so that people know that they are new Mm -hmm. but yeah that's unfortunate but it's part of we didn't pay a whole lot for it it didn't pay a lot for it and it's part of reselling it is things happen i also like um i think interesting items Mm -hmm. so art stuff or we had a couple of avant-garde magazines which were made for like a two-year period in new york um, from 1968 to, I think, 1971, so maybe three years. So just a very it's small a niche, print run. And... Yep, it's a niche magazine. We found them in an estate sale of people who really liked art. We bought a lot of stuff for our house there. Um, and we sold those. Actually, we sent them back to New York. Huh. We sold two of them together as a set, and someone in New York City bought them. Shipped them right back to New York. Hmm. And then also we had a... I found there's a band called A Perfect Circle. It's from the guy who was from Tool, I guess. And I went to an estate sale around here and I found a poster from their concert in Detroit in 2017. And I got not a lot of money and sold it to somebody who's probably a fan. Yeah. So those were, that was kind of neat. It was a, it was a cool piece anyway. I mean, that graphic art on the poster was really cool. We'll throw it up on the screen. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So I, those kinds of things, it's cool to see like, I'm interested in art and stuff, so it's interesting to sell that kind of thing. I think it'd be cool to be a, like a low-level art dealer, kind of like bringing art to the masses and like. And, and that just circles right back around to the weird things that pop out at you mm-hmm. are generally the things that are fun to find and easy to sell. Mm-hmm. Because if you're interested in what it is and what it looks like, someone else is too. Yeah, and I think it depends. Sometimes that even goes, if you have a really niche taste, but you know mm-hmm. that there's another um, group of people that have similar taste, those things, if they are out of the norm, or out, I, I should say out of the, when I say norm, I mean the general populace might not be attracted to them, but specific groups of people are. Mm-hmm. That might just be sitting there because no one else likes it except for you and the specific group of people that are into that. Yep. So like hobo clowns. Hobo <laughs> clowns. I'm not into hobo clowns, but some people are into hobo clowns. And there, and it seems that a lot of people who have estate sales and garage sales have a lot of hobo clowns. Hobo clowns and clowns in general mm-hmm. had a moment apparently a few decades, uh, more than a few decades ago. But we would love to know if, if that is a thing in your area or is this a regional obsession? Yeah, we I got we got to get to the bottom of the hobo clown phenomenon. Yeah, should we be picking up hobo clowns? <laughs> we need to know because we might be missing out on a gold mine. Who knows? <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> All right. Do you have anything else to to close with here? No, that. That's it. All right. Thank you so much for joining us again for episode two. Um, we hope to see you again next week. Please Until leave any time. comments below and like and subscribe. Yep. Until next time, take care. Bye.